Okay, uh, let's start. Uh, my name is Yochai Benter, I'm uh, one of the professors here at the law school and, and uh, over at Berkman. We are extremely fortunate. We are extremely fortunate to have with us uh, today Niva Elkin Cohen, a professor at uh, Haifa University Faculty of Law, former dean of the Faculty of Law, founder of uh, uh, both of these organizations, both the Haifa Center for Law and Technology, and now after she finished with the deanship, the new center on cyber law and policy focused more on various range of threats. Uh, Niva is an old friend and an old colleague uh, uh, for many years. She has the distinction of always being somewhere between five and 10 years ahead of everybody else on most, uh, at least on many issues. Uh, wrote what was probably the first significant uh, uh, piece on, on um, how copyright intersects with democratic meaning making in bulletin board services. And then when we were all very busy talking about non-state, non-market models, uh, she wrote The Invisible Hand, uh, uh, telling us that the state was coming back using a variety of, of levers uh, that we today all are familiar with, but at the time we weren't thinking about. And in the last few years has been spending uh, uh, time in several dimensions looking at the ways in which um, the weak in the context of what we often worry about as technology empowers the powerful can reverse technology in ways that uh, provide new forms of power. And I see this new paper as very much of a piece with that. Uh, and perhaps Niva's prescience in the last 25 years suggests that in five years or, or 10 years, we'll all be somewhat more optimistic than most of our conversations are uh, today. So Niva, please. Wow, great to be here. Um, thank you. This, I would, I'd love to think that I can live up to the expectations. Uh, but I'm thrilled to be here and, and also thrilled to, uh, and thank you all for coming at this uh, late time of the day. Um, and uh, I'm particularly thrilled to discuss uh, this uh, paper that is a work in progress, uh, and I'd love to uh, use this opportunity and, 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 and try to go through this really quickly so I can uh, hear what you have to say about this. Uh, I'd like to start with uh, two caveats, and that is one that is that I landed this morning at 5 a.m., and I'm uh, practically asleep now. This is midnight for me, and, uh, and so I hope uh, to keep uh, uh, being uh, coherent. And the second is that um, I am going to discuss um, content moderation uh, by platforms, but I'm not going to in discuss the um, Elizabeth Warren versus Zuckerberg debate regarding uh, whether uh, platforms should engage in fact checking and in uh, filtering fake news, uh, um, uh, oversighting um, some um, propaganda or advertising by uh, political campaigns of politicians. Uh, I do have an opinion about this. I think that uh, maybe uh, tomorrow at this exactly the same time, we may have an opportunity to discuss this in another uh, great event organized by the Berkman Center. Uh, so this is also a promo, not just a caveat. Uh, but I am going to discuss uh, the way, another way in which platforms are actually shaping our public sphere uh, and using power, exercising power uh, that they have over data and, the, uh, inform uh, and information flows uh, by filtering, filtering uh, uh, the public uh, discourse. And, and this type of... Uh, focus is actually uh, related not necessarily to the who is doing this, but to some extent uh, also. But uh, it focuses more on the how, how it is being done. And, and, and uh, it's, it's linked to uh, a more general agenda related to governance by AI. And I think that uh, 
the way in which uh, content is being filtered by AI system worldwide, uh, especially by these mega platforms. Uh, this is uh, something that is um, uh, troubling, interesting, and challenging uh, the way in which we think about the public sphere, but also about the law and how the law can address governance by AI in general, uh, where the <coughs> law is in some ways incompatible with uh, the way in which uh, AI is governing behavior, but also uh, it is challenging the law in particular when we talk about content moderation by AI. So I'm going to briefly talk about this, uh, just uh, um, say a few words about how we got here, what type of systems are out there, uh, what type of challenges it raised for the type of oversight and interventions that we have in law, and, and then come quickly to my proposal and get your feedback on this. So that's the plan. Uh, and, and when you look at this slide, this is sort of the announcement by Facebook about how they do content moderation. And, uh, we talk a lot about uh, you know, moderators and how they suffer and they have to look through all these materials and, and that's of course valid, but the vast majority of content is being filtered by AI, automated, right? And so if you can come to think about it in terms of terrorist propaganda, for instance, what is defined as terrorist propaganda? 99.5% based on the, you know, on the reports of Facebook is actually being filtered by AI before it, it is even being perceived by anyone, right? 38 of hate speech. These are enormous numbers. This is a robust system that is actually filtering out a lot of uh, content. And the question is, how do we got here? And to some extent, it's obvious, right? This is a volume of information that has to be screened and filtered. Uh, but the law had a lot of, you know, was helping this development in many ways. So one uh, uh, could think of this legal regime that we have adopted in the late 90s, where uh, the safe harbor regime, we're actually um, immunity from liability was offered to uh, hosting facilities uh, if they implement a notice and takedown um, regime where right holders could uh, issue a notice and then uh, platforms would have to expeditiously remove that content. And so this has quickly turned into something automatic, first by right holders identifying infringing materials and sending these notices, and these robo-notices were actually dealt with, right, or accepted in the, at the accepting as the receiving side by other robots, right, that started to manage these um, large volumes. Um, that brings me to the current uh, European uh, regime, just um, the controversial Article 17 in Europe, that is actually holding hosting facilities liable for uh, infringing content um, that is distributed or shared by the users, except when they acquire a license or they install a filter, right? And so this is, these, these are strong incentives to actually implement uh, some of these systems. Um, what else come to mind is, is, is uh, the um, duty to remove um, um, illegal content um, in Germany, that is the, the act to improve the enforcement of rights and social networks. I hope that this is the right translation uh, from German, but if a platform is being faced with a 50 million euro uh, fine, you know, unless um, uh, to the extent that it doesn't uh, perform this um, uh, removal within 24 hours of what is considered illegal, uh, that requires um, some sort of automation. And of course, a removal by an hour would require some sort of automation. And that is a proposal that is being, uh, that passed the, the European Parliament regarding terrorist content. It's still pending uh, the approval uh, of the European Council. So. Uh, when we talk about content filtering 
by AI, it's everywhere. It's everywhere in, in copyright, right? So you have, uh, I think, Content ID is the most uh, well-known system that has started, uh, was developed by YouTube, started as a filtering for copyright infringing materials, and then turn, was turned into a business model of Content ID where you don't need to actually remove infringing materials, but could actually monetize them if you want, right? Depending on the... Uh, uh, choice of the of the right holders. We have um, a scrib that is this uh, book repository that is using content ID that is actually an ID, a digital ID uh, that is based on a semantic analysis of the book and would allow you to uh, automatically identify uh, infringing books. You have something similar in, in Flickr to identify infringing photographs. You have an AI system that is being used by Amazon for brands. But it's not just intellectual property, right? So uh, Pinster, Pinterest is actually using this, uh, these systems in order to remove, to identify uh, analyze and remove uh, videos uh, that um, you know of, of, of people that are harming themselves to prevent suicide. Uh, we have that in the context of removing um, um, videos of um, of shootings of the massacre in New Zealand, but also now uh, more recently uh, in Germany. A lot of reports on that. Tech Against Terrorism is actually a consortium of, of high-tech companies that developed a confidential data set of hashtags that are, at, that are identifying terrorist propaganda and are using this uh, to remove whatever is considered a terrorist propaganda in, you know, by, by these uh, companies. Uh, and that includes Microsoft, Facebook, uh, and, and some other uh, giants. Uh, it doesn't have to be um, done by hashtags or an ID of the content that you're trying to remove and target by these systems. You can actually use AI in order to sometimes predict whether some content is going to be uploaded online. So this paper is actually describing a way in which AI systems can actually analyze chat rooms and discussions among people who are planning to live stream some um, um, recordings of um, sports game, right? In order to prevent the, you know, a copyright infringement. But you could think of these systems working to prevent some other live broadcasts of. Uh, of protests, right, of uh, demonstrations, uh, and of course, uh, of violent crimes. So we have a lot of systems of that sort. Um, and when we come to think about this, all of these systems are actually uh, have uh, some things uh, in common. And so when uh, when we think of these systems, they all take content that is being uploaded by users. They um, analyze this content by using a screening uh, algorithm that is informed by features provided in the context of copyright infringement by right holders in the context of terrorist propaganda, could be by, informed by governments, right? And these features and the weight that is given to them is actually um, allowing the analysis of this uh, content. So it's either by using the hashtags or content idea or what have you. You have some sort of uh, outcome for such an analysis and that is translated to some action that is, could be a removal of that content from the platform. It could also be uh, the blocking of a link if you're Google. Um, and it could be a, an update to a filter that would not allow similar content to be uploaded. What is really interesting about this system or these systems 
uh, that makes the um, uh, machine learning, right, or AI in, in, uh, in the meaning of machine learning, not uh, uh, in the broader sense of AI, that it has this feedback loop. So what you're removing is actually being used to inform the algorithm of what else would have to be removed in the future. So the more content that is infringing that you're removing, your algorithm will change and adapt and be refined to more accurately determine the removal or the infringing nature of more content that is similar. And so the more you remove whatever it is that is described as uh, terrorist propaganda, the more the system learns how to uh, define similar content uh, in order to remove it. So when we think about uh, you know, these uh, systems, uh, the first function is, of course, supplying a norm that is defined somewhere. So in copyright, it's really should be easy, but uh, of course those of us that I'm coming from, uh, it's no hard to, to guess, so this is uh, the background from which I'm coming. Um, in copyright, the question of how to apply the norm would be in the details, right? So you should not copy without a license, but how much, is a, how much do you need to copy in order to trigger infringement? Is it three seconds? Is it 30 seconds? Is it the whole copy? Uh, so these, are, these norms are not only applying a norm that is already written, but also interpreting the norms. And, and uh, in many ways are um, also setting the norms, right? And so that if you know that you cannot upload something that is 30% or three seconds similar to a content, you, know, you can no longer upload videos that uh, you know qualified as substantially similar to the content as such. Substantial similarities would normally be a legal test that will be decided by courts, not by um, coders. And so um, what is really interesting is to look at this process of norm setting. This process of norm um Norm setting is actually uh, defining not only what is infringing or what is considered a terrorist propaganda rather than uh, an expression of protest, uh, but also has to optimize a particular goal. So if my goal is to um, maximize the removal of infringing materials, that would be one goal. Maybe I can also refine that goal and say, well, yes, just infringing materials, uh, but provided that they are not fair use or materials that are being used for educational purposes, just to make this simple, right? But then I'll have to decide how much educational it should be, right? Or how much of a fair use it should be. And all these decisions have to be made ex ante. Uh, you can't wait for the case to come. You have to say how much of a, how much was copied, and and how you are going. What type of weight you're going to give to that fact that a lot has been copied or a little has been copied, compared to the question of where it came from. Same thing with. Uh, geolocation of terrorist propaganda, right? To what extent you are going to consider this when you're removing content? Once you decide what that trade-off is going to be between the different values that you put into this bucket, uh, these would be the trade-offs that would be implemented by the system, and the system optimization would implement the same trade-off. Whereas in law, we would normally think of a principle, right? Fair use, or national security and free speech. And we will have institutions that will determine these trade-offs down the road, right? We won't have to do that ex ante. But we think that there are institutions 
courts, for instance, that could decide it later on, right? We have these principles in the Constitution. We don't decide the trade-offs um, um, ex ante. Um, definitions of the trade-offs would be um, concealed, right? We won't have any uh, access to it. Uh, sometimes even the programmers, in, you know, depending on the design of the system, would not know exactly you know, what the trade-off is unless you are playing with the system and learn what it does. Uh, and the feedback loop would make this uh, dynamic, right? So that every time, uh, uh, that, is, that is a system that is changing every time you get new content that, that could actually refine the way in which these systems are making the classifications. Um, this is not an error-free system, right? And so you can have, for instance, I think that this was hilarious when a script that I just um, mentioned before is a, is a storage, right? It's a hosting facility for books. And uh, there was a, the Mueller report that uh, was, of course, a report that was um, prepared by the federal government. It's public domain, but some publishers also publish it, and so they con include it in the and the ID, right, and the system actually recognizes it. it's something that is proprietary and has been removed automatically because that is how the system works. But also, in more uh, 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 tragic situations where you think of uh, the way in which YouTube is actually recognizing some of the films that are being recorded, the videos that are recorded by activists in, in Syria on, on war crimes are being deleted just because they are uh, misidentified. So when we think about oversight, one, way, one reason to do it is efficiency and, and quality control to prevent these errors and biases that are inevitable, but we want to make sure that there is some check on that, right? Uh, but there are other reasons why I think that we need to have uh, oversight over the way filtering is being done. And one is uh, that these systems are, in fact, that are being used, as, and, and this is in, the, in this context, it's not just AI that is being do, done by Flickr, for instance, but by the major platforms. Um, these systems are actually converging some of their um, private interests and, and, and the public function of enforcement uh, uh, in the same um, infrastructure and the same with the same algorithm with the same training data that is actually performing three different functions. So the first function is the matchmaking of content and users. That is what Facebook is doing for a living, right? To match the users with particular content so that each of us would get the feed that we deserve, right? And so, or that um, YouTube would give us the recommendation system that fit our own, you know, our preferences. That's the business model. But at the same time, that same system with the same datafication and the same training data and the same feedback loop would also do and law enforcement for the purpose of um, um, incitement for violence in the United States or the purpose of hate speech if, it, if you're in Europe, right? Uh, or the purpose of copyright around the world. In the middle, there will also be some content moderation, and that would depend on the community guidelines of each uh, system. And so our public sphere that is made of all of that is actually the output of a system that is doing different functions, but um, uh, these functions are not separated, uh, are done uh, by the, se the same uh, algorithm, data, um, um, training data, uh, and the same learning and feedback mechanism and uh, could not be um, actually separated, at least the way uh, these systems are working now. And so efficiency, alignment of incentives, uh, but also the need to restrain power. And here we have, uh, in our, um, you know, the system of, of um, 
content uh, filtering is uh, pretty robust and the way in which we normally would restrain power, the power of the state through separation of power um, uh, using our, you know, the rule of law with the separation of power between the different agencies of the state, uh, our constitutional rights. Um, that would be one way of restraining power. The other way would be a market mechanism, either in consumers' rights or competition in the market. One of the problems that we're facing is that we have this robust system of filtering with none of these actually um, uh, being functional. Uh, and that has to do, again, with the fact that these uh, systems are being uh, uh, are working, you know, are being exercised and, and applied by the social media platforms. So to quickly uh, go through the uh, barriers to oversight, um, why don't we know uh, how? Why can we have like some public conversation about things that are being uh, filtered out by? Um, uh, AI system, uh, first of all, because a lot of them are filtering things before they're being uploaded. But second, because the way our public sphere is designed is that we talk about a public sphere as if we have a conversation like we have here. Uh, but it's not really a public sphere, it's actually publics that are made of are, are separate feeds, and so we don't know what we don't know, right? I don't know whether I think the reason that I don't see anything is because this is the way uh, my feed, look, you know, this is how my feed look like, looks like, or whether it's because none of us see that, right? So I don't really know. There is less of a public oversight because we no longer have that public. Uh, the opacity is something that is talked about a lot when we talk about AI systems. It's, it's all buried in the data and the algorithm, the learning algorithm. It's dynamic, it's changing. What you know that happened yesterday not necessarily reflects the situation today because of that um, uh, feedback loop. And, and finally, um, in that public-private fusion that I've seen, you know, that I've demonstrated before, what we have is uh, intellectual property rights or just property rights over the servers. They don't want to let you in their data because they own it, the algorithms are kept as, tra as a trade secret, etc. All right, so how do we guard the guardians? In the literature, we have um, a few uh, proposals. You know, I think that it's nice to. Um, uh, divide them into two types. Uh, some are regulatory, where you have calls for more transparency, more auditing, uh, due process in terms of allowing more appeal, to have some way of uh, actually uh, uh, dissenting uh, a removal of some sort. I'm happy to talk more about this in the Q&A, but I think that none of them provide uh, a good solution uh, for where we're at. Uh, there are some technical proposals, some are really interesting, uh, such as requiring by regulation that platforms will reconfigure, right? And so we can say, we, we know what the trade-offs should be, right? We want uh, uh, terrorist propaganda to be removed uh, as long as it doesn't violate freedom of speech, and here is a formula. We'll tell you, Facebook, what you have to do. Let's assume we're not in the United States, and that we, you know, like in some European countries, actually have an idea of how you should balance this. Uh, but even if we had a way of telling platforms how to do that, uh, we don't have a good way of oversighting this, and that is where the problem is again, right? That we can tell them what to do, but we don't know how to check that they're actually doing what we ask them to do. Some of the subversive tools are also really interesting. A lot of proposal on how to challenge some of these systems, but they're good in terms of protest. They're also important in terms of challenging these systems uh, and sometimes to reveal what they're doing, but they're not, do as, they're not good enough as an overall 
uh, uh, solution. And of course, here the proposal of Facebook to have some independent oversight group. I can talk for hours about this. Uh, again, we, maybe it will come uh, again in the Q&A. So what is my proposal? And my proposal is pretty simple. Uh, and it's a proposal to actually introduce adversary into that monolithic system. And so the idea is pretty simple, is that you have, uh, right now you have that system that is monolithic in the sense that it's, it's optimizing one value, regardless of how many values you had in the bucket, you actually decide what it is that you're optimizing, how you trade off between them, and then you decide whether to keep it or remove. My proposal is that before you act on removal, you create an adversarial intervention by a public AI. And I'd like to talk about the public AI. I know that we are all get used to the idea that the public cannot do um, <coughs> creative and innovative <coughs> things, but let us be reminded that the internet was developed by the public, right? And so the public could do a lot of things. Um, and I think that here the public could actually uh, develop an AI system. There are many barriers to that, but one of the reasons that I think that we could do that is that we, if we were able to require platforms to give us the data about what they remove and run it through a system that can actually screen that decision about removal by an algorithm that is informed by the public values, I think that uh, we can have some, we can make some progress. So of course one of the questions would be, what is the public values, right? Um, uh, in a very simple uh, system, as I described here, just for the uh, um, purpose of the, of the demonstration, you can think about <coughs> copyright. If you can copyright, we think about a removal system that is giving more emphasis to right holders' interest and view about what has to be removed. The public system in that context could actually include uh, some data and values uh, that are not being represented here. Some, everything that is externality for this system. So you can have here, this system could be informed by court cases about fair use. This system could be informed by observational data of libraries and, and, and schools about what is considered fair use. Uh, and you can use that data in order to teach that system, and that system, and I think that you, that is actually the idea, would have to use the, um, the output of the private system as an input, make a decision from a public perspective, and then fit it into that feedback loop so we have a way uh, that could articulate the public view in an algorithmic way. Adversary is something that is important both for law and for computer science, it turned out. I was surprised, I come from a, a legal, uh, my, my, my background is law, and in law, especially in common law, we cannot even determine what the truth is before we have two sides, right? It's like judges would have to listen to the plaintiff and then to the defendant. Right? It's very hard to act, even determine, you know, what is the correct and right uh, description of the facts before you heard the other side. It turned out that in computer science there is also literature about adversary in systems that you don't really understand, but you use another system that is also wrong and you don't understand in order to understand that first system, because it helps you flesh out where the things where the errors are, are in, in uh, where the vulnerabilities are. Um, so adversary uh, uh, would help us uh, uh, oversight the private system. Another issue to uh, flesh out is data. The fact that we don't have 
I mean, data today is something that is important both for the purpose of oversighting platforms, but also for the purpose of innovating, right? And here we have a way of not just reporting the data or sharing the data with your competitors, that is something that no platform would be willing to do, but just running that data would give us, through the algorithm, would actually allow us not only the oversight, but also the um, ability to innovate and build a system that can articulate public values using that training data. The final uh, uh, point is about the trade-offs. So if we think about, for instance, again, let's just think about the copyright example. You have a film that is being, or a video that is being uploaded, the platform is looking for infringements. If it's not infringing, it remains online. If it is infringing, you have to run it through the public AI system. And then that public AI system may decide or may determine that this is fair use. What happened then, right, when you have controversy between a conflict between the public and the private system? In that case, the proposal actually seek to uh, resolve that conflict, but, uh, and, and you can resolve it by a, a human review, right? Uh, but you can also resolve it uh, in a computational way. So in some cases, we could actually think of, I mean, the system doesn't really, these systems actually don't tell you whether this is infringing or not, or whether this is fair use or not, but the output of AI systems would be, it's 87% that this is a, an infringing copy, right? Or it's 37% that this is a, a, a fair use educational purpose. And then you can at some point create um, a matrix that would allow you to uh, articulate these trade-offs in a computational way. So the more cases that would come to a human review, you will be able to generate some trade-offs that are uh, predetermined and would actually can fit into the system. Um, but uh, the um, advantage of having a system, an adversarial system like this, is actually uh, in making the trade-offs that the AI filtering system are making more visible so that we can see what it is that we are missing by this monolithic system. Right now we don't know what is being removed and we don't know what the trade-off is. And so uh, as an institutional structure this system can actually um, enable this. All right, so the proposal, this is the proposal. Um, uh, at the regulatory level, the idea is to incentivize platforms to run their uh, data removal through the public AI system uh, to allow us to build this. And, and here I think and a good incentive would be to make the immunity or the safe harbor that they have now conditional upon running their um, uh, decision on removal of that system before taking action in uh, on removing the content. Um, it also include uh, computational uh, dispute resolution and the human review as I've just uh, described. And at the technical level, uh, what we'll have to build is uh, a public AI that would offer a real-time check on content moderation. This is a way of not doing it before the removal once or before giving us the system, um, allowing the system to work once and ex ante, or checking it every three months, or checking it once a year, or checking only the outcomes, or getting reports, but having an ecosystem where a public system can actually check this system on an ongoing basis. Some advantages is to actually enable a more pluralistic system of uh, filtering content where we have more values 
that we than we have now, especially more values in the public sphere that we can actually discuss and negotiate and have a conversation about, whereas now this is all being done uh, under the cover of, of code. Um, we have a public fix here for something that is being done in private. It's ongoing and dynamic, and um, it, it requires us to think more creatively about the way in which um, um, our public system and our legal system intervene in these um, sort of private or semi-private public spheres. Um, there are, of course, some challenges, incentives and funding. I thought this was the biggest challenge, but now I come to think about tax. Right? I mean, this is sort of a pollution that comes from social media, so maybe they have to pay for this, but not to build this, right? We can fund it by using tax, um, tax money uh, on platforms in order to sponsor a public uh, AI system that would oversight the private filtering systems. Um, of course, there are questions about you know, what's in and what's out in the public AI. How do we determine this? Who is deciding this? There are ways to do that. It's not as if we don't know how to involve stakeholders in administrative, legislative, and legal decision-making processes. We have that in the environment context, and we have it in other contexts where we actually have some ways of um, involving stakeholders, you know, what are the institutions and agents that are part of the decision making in particular content um, uh, filtering um, context. And I think what is really interesting is to think about some of the implications for law and how the law should change its, its role here, right? The legal intervention in terms of a system would require courts to actually undertake a different role. Um, and that would be to provide some uh, oversight to the uh, uh, AI um, over public oversighting tool. Um, so these are in bullets. I look at the time, and so I really want to keep some time for uh, to, to hear what your thoughts about this. Uh, and so I'll stop here, and, and I'm looking forward to your comments. Thank you for your interesting talk. Um, I had never thought about a public AI before. Um, I spontaneously have um, two issues with it that I would like to raise, and maybe you can debunk them. Um, the first being that um, right now I don't really see the, the additional value of having two checks, first a private and then a public check, because it seems to me that at this point most private providers are actually not very much in favor of deleting a lot. They're basically doing it mostly uh, due to public pressure. And so that means they're actually um, basically only deleting what they have to delete um, according to public values anyway. So why would these two algorithms actually be different? And also, even if there would be differences, why doesn't the, the public just provide their algorithm to the companies and say you have to use it? Why would there have to be two algorithms? So that's the, the first point. And the other point is that, um, well, it kind of seemed to me that you were um, working on the assumption that there are certain public values that we can um, employ in, the, in this uh, public algorithm. But I think there's actually a lot of debate about what should actually be deleted and what should be kept on the internet. And there are people that would delete much more hate speech and others that say we should leave the conversation much more open. So um, I think there would have to be very much an active political decision uh, on how to configure this public algorithm. Mm -hmm. And I don't really see any 
even near consensus happening about that in the near future. Yeah, two excellent points, thank you. So for the first point, I think um, we, you know, you, you sort of assume that the platforms are um, removing the thing that they should remove. I would argue that we don't have a clue about what it is that they're being removing, right? And so every once in a while, <coughs> we get some anecdotes about what it is being, what it is that is being removed. But except for people that are working in these companies, and in some occasions that I had a pick on what it is, um, I don't think that as a public, right, as a, like the, the polity, we know what it is that is being removed and what are the reasons. And I was trying to explain there are many reasons, some of them legitimate, right? If you are a platform and you want to maximize the number of users and you want to be, you want your platform to be attractive to a big enough number, sometimes you will remove things in order to cater for the preferences. And I think that would be, we would normally think about this as, as a, a, a legitimate uh, business interest. But I think that as a society, and, and, can, and that would depend on the country, right? Different countries would have different rules about the limits of free speech. Uh, we at least have some consensus in these, you know, in, in the, within the country about our laws, right? And how the law, the law has, you know, is, is actually has to be implemented. You're right, and that goes to your second point, is that um, in the current situation of liberal democracies is that maybe there is no such agreement. And that cannot be resolved by this uh, system. This system can actually be good for the context in which we do have agreement. But I think that it could help us reach agreement if we knew what it is, right, that is being removed. And I think that one of the problems that we are facing now is that this is all being done uh, behind the scene, right? We <coughs> don't know. And, and I think that this is a really, uh, that creates another level of risk for liberal democracies. The platforms can actually, if they don't have to face any public scrutiny because no one knows what it is that is being removed, um, they become more vulnerable to those who can know, which are governments or you know more powerful players uh, uh, in that context. So I think that this is uh, just by you know creating a way for us to oversight that is more um, practical and more visible could be more visible for the public. I think that that is something that could also contribute to a conversation that hopefully uh, will end up in, in, in some agreement. Um, and, but just to, uh, a, last, a last point to that, so just to, to make it more concrete, concrete, so in the context of copyright, we do agree, right? I mean, there, there, are, there is a law. Some people think that it should be, you know, that it should allow more fair use, right? In, in terms on, on terrorist propaganda, I think there is also some agreement. On child pornography, there is also some agreement. So there are some cases, even in this country, that where you can agree, right? And I think that you will find more consensus on a more uh, a wide variety of, of, of issues in other countries outside the United States, where you have a, uh, the issue of free speech is, is, is a little bit, or regulation is a little bit different. Hello, uh, I'm Julia Reda. I'm a former member of the European Parliament. And as you know, I spent quite a lot of time trying to discourage uh, the use of uh, these technologies for copyright enforcement. And But uh, you are right, of course, it's, it's a fact of life that platforms do use them and uh, possibly have to use them uh, to comply with the law. Uh, I, so I think it's interesting to think about how to make the system better. But I do see a few issues, uh, some are particular to copyright and some are particular to AI. 
Uh, first of all, I think in order to build such a public AI, you would have to have copyright registration. Because uh, the, the example that you give, for example, of uh, scripts deleting the Miller report, it's a case of, of copy fraud, where simply a right holder registers something that they don't actually hold the copyright <coughs> in. And I think that as long as you don't have an authoritative public registry of copyright information, an AI will not be able to learn that because there is simply no basis for knowing who the real right holder is. Um, the other is a bit more a problem with AI as such, um, which is that certain uh, distinctions are easier to make for AI. So it's easier to match a pattern to see this song is the same as that song, even though some changes have been made. Uh, but it's much more difficult for AI to do something like determine whether something is a parody. Uh, because it's, it's much more complex, the AI would have to develop a sense of humor, uh, so to speak. And uh, perhaps connected to that, it's also the problem that the fair use is only a defense. So that means a platform that found it difficult to, to comply with fair use could simply, in its terms and conditions, say we only allow licensed materials. So uh, I think it would also be necessary to turn the fair use or the copyright exceptions into users' rights that they can actually positively rely on against the platform. Um, I'm not sure I've, that the change of the safe harbor in the way that you propose is a good idea, because at the moment, the safe harbor is creating an incentive for the platform to leave things online that they might otherwise delete. And so I'm not sure if it makes sense to say, OK, you can only rely on this safe harbor to leave things online if you first uh, use this uh, public <coughs> algorithms where the purpose of it is also to leave things online, because the incentives are not really going in opposite directions. If you, it, I'm, I don't know, it might be a bit I'm not a fully developed thought, but I don't think that the incentives are pulling in the same direction there. And um, finally, I would like to question whether there is a consensus on copyright uh, in the sense that I believe if copyright were perfectly enforced on the internet, society would collapse. And uh, quite often in the discussion we had in the parliament, I would <coughs> certain concerns were disregarded by saying, well, but nobody is going to enforce it. For example, taking pictures of public architecture and things like that. Uh, and so I would question whether perfect enforcement of copyright is even something that is desirable. Yeah. Well, thank you. <laughs> very, very interesting and provocative points, I think. Uh, so I'll, I'll, I'll start from the end. I don't, this, this system doesn't uh, intend to improve copyright enforcement. It intends to correct it and make it more accurate. It actually, uh, since you know, this system is going to check whether you were right in removing something. I actually think that that is something the platform would welcome. So I mean, I don't think any reason. You know, if I would be, yeah, if I was Facebook, why not, right? I mean, I would actually. I think that if I hear the platforms now, they say regulate us. Don't make me accountable. I don't want to make these decisions for you. You cannot agree on your free speech uh, boundaries and limits. We don't want that to be our problem because we have a business to run. Go sort out your issues and tell us what to do, right? And now this procedure actually intends to tell what to do because you cannot do it up front. You don't know how to do it up front. You have to engage in a conversation. And that conversation has to be computational because this is how that system is working. And in order to fix this, because now it is removing things. I mean, you, you, you talked about the Mueller report as if this is fraud, but I don't think it was fraud. I don't think that this was, maybe it was intentional. I don't think so. I just think that that is how the system works. If you're a publisher, they assume that you are the right holders, right? And that is that is a status quo now. If you want to fix it, then you have to intervene in it, right? This is the I mean, this system cannot make things worse. If 
Um, you know, it, it can only say it's a parody. If it doesn't recognize a parody, well, this, this would have been removed anywhere, right? And so if it does manage to identify it as a parody, then it may remain. It may make th things better. So I think that um, the hope is that this, uh, you know, a system of that sort would allow us to articulate our public values in a way that would be effective in in a computational conversation that is that was actually that is actually now constituting, you know, our public sphere, and so. Uh, and in terms of context, actually, there, you know, this is getting better. It's true that there were a few reports about AI, uh, that uh, the systems that cannot identify context, and you know, in copyright, it doesn't identify parity, maybe. Uh, but but when we think about human rights, it's even worse uh, when it gets it wrong. Um, but I think that um, that it is getting better. And again, the idea is to have it uh, informed by um, a variety of values and not by a monolithic set of values. Hi, uh, thank you for the presentation. Um, my question is about um, Maybe one assumption, or maybe it's not an assumption, I don't know, but you were saying that one possibility would be for the government to tell companies how to regulate content, right? But that has an oversight problem, and so this solution would overcome that oversight problem, but it remains the idea that making moderation better means making it more similar to the legal system. Uh, and I wonder if... Um, if that's necessary, I disagree that uh, platforms try to take down as little as possible. I think they try to take down all the legal content and a lot of lawful content. And for some cases, I wonder if they might have a justification to do that. Uh, according to this model, it, it seems to imply that a better world would be a world where Facebook allows all nudity on the site, which might be the case or might not be the case. But I was wondering if that is the assumption and, and why. Yeah. So again, I think these are these are very good points, and I think that there is that there is no way around um, resolving some of the conflicts that we have in society about what should be you know part of our public sphere and public conversation. We need to agree about that. And if we cannot agree about this, no system or institution or computational way of uh, uh, removing or keeping things would help us. Uh, I think that we are not moving forward in developing a conversation about this if this is happening in a way that is um, not accessible for us as public. We don't know. Uh, and so we don't have the way of even having a conversation about this. Uh, it's not as if I think that more things should remain online or less things should remain online. I think that uh, the question is why. Why they're being removed and why they're being kept online. I think that uh, right now, even mapping, you know, the ways in which the systems that are on the ground are being informed by by different considerations. And I bet that some people here also had some conversations with uh, platforms, and uh, and there were really interesting consultations that Facebook was doing when you know, around the world in con you know in considering their oversight board as if you know, that would be a solution, that you'll have a committee that would think about something that happens every, you know, this is, hap this is happening instantly, but you'll have a committee of people that would think about what? Principles? How are they being implemented in the details of your system that is actually deciding whether my presentation remains and yours is being removed? This is the type of oversight that we need. 
And so, but we need that in order to decide whether more things should remain online or less things, and, why, but, and in order to understand why and deliberate on this. We don't, we, we, we just don't, we, we can't do that right now. Thank you so much for your presentation. It was really insightful, at least for me, um, and especially the fact that it is really a challenge to just live in the hands of any sort of ex post intervention, any kind of content moderation, or the challenge to any automated kind of content moderation. That's why um, last year, uh, I was part of one of the dynamic coalitions uh, for the Internet Governance Forum, and we developed a set of best practices where we were investigating how different platforms actually remove content, and also how different platforms delete users. And the idea of these best practices was actually to instill a kind of due process so that users have a way of contesting this automated removal, as you rightly put it. So, of course, in this case, this model that you propose seems actually quite useful and handy. However, uh, my concerns are more in line of how to implement it. So, for instance, I cannot remember your name, but... Um, Carol. So, as Harold just said, uh, the decision is also very political. So, even though we might agree that in certain jurisdictions, I'm going to use the word jurisdiction as opposed to how in the internet jurisdictions uh, do not en entirely exist as such, how to choose not only the social values on which we can more or less agree upon, but also how to choose in the event of clashing values how to choose which values are we prioritizing, especially if we have or if we are proposing a model that is based on machine learning, you are like feeding the machine like what type of values are gonna be prioritized in a particular type of conflict, but probably you don't want to prioritize that value in a different type of conflict. So how that will work in a case by case basis is basically uh, the practical implementation like question that pops my mind when when uh, saying your or trying to uh, figure out how your uh, your proposal will work in practice otherwise quite interesting thank you may I suggest given the time that we picked there were a couple more questions and then you you uh, collect them together is that, uh, right now. will that work uh, for you yeah. um, absolutely uh, I see there's one there and one right there Instead of one public AI, should there be three or four or more which are written independently by people who don't know each other and therefore you know, have different algorithms in them? So I'm sorry, could you, could you just uh, repeat this? I'm sorry that I... I, I missed you. Should there be more than one, three or four, that, three or four competing public AI systems? Yeah, okay. That people would choose how? Can I just write? No, that's... Who, who would get to choose which one? Well, I'm not sure. I'm not more speculating here. It's like, you know, it seems like it's better if there's a multiplicity of these systems and that they're written independently of each other. You know, there, there are other parts of computer, there are other parts of computer science where we like the idea of there being redundant, separately written systems, and maybe this is another such place. Yeah. I feel like we keep upping the ante as we go around. I was going to um, ask how you would feel about having multiple AI systems as well. Um, you could imagine having an AI system which is the legal floor, which is a minimum on what would need to be taken down, which still has all the oversight and transparency problems that we have anyway. But um, why don't we just have individual AIs as well, which would then provide that delta between those things which we want our own personal experience based on our own norms to dictate um, versus the legal mm. floor. Okay, 
All right, so uh, three good points. How to implement, um, again, I have an idea of how to do it in, in, you know, in, in the paper I demonstrate this in the context of, of copyright. Because um, I think this is, uh, it's, a, it's actually, it was chosen because this is the easiest case and it doesn't uh, trigger a lot of, uh, you know, political issues. So there are some control controversies, but, but I think that it, the idea is to encourage controversy, but just to make it more visible and, and, and actually um, create a space for it to happen. That is, negotiating values has to uh, be made in a, in a public debate. Uh, I think that as we move from a speech that is not being regulated, uh, it, the, you know, the system, uh, is more difficult to implement. So, in this country, it would be difficult to uh, imagine a system of that sort regarding hate speech because this is a private. This this this, this would be determined by uh, you know the different systems according to their uh, business uh, profile. But in Germany, where you have a law, actually, that is something that uh, would be easier to do and the values are actually the values that are being set by law and the way they are being applied should be the way in which the courts have done so. And so I think that I agree with you that there will be new cases that have not been determined by law, by courts I mean, uh, and then the system will have to, uh, um, to actually push the controversy into a human decision maker that could actually inform the system about cases of that sort until that other case that hasn't been sorted out would come again. Uh, multiple systems, yes. Actually, I think we can think of a procedure saying we have a problem with the monolithic system adversary could actually flesh out some of the uh, problems and maybe you should run this by a system that is considered the good is uh, uh, kosher stamp as being public and not uh, private and I can think of also implementations again I can think about this in the case of copyright that libraries would that actually there'll be a market for this Right for fair use, the limitations of some sorts, and so you can think about these filtering systems that are determining limitations and exceptions, or fair use, uh, or free speech in other, you know, like in 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 in, in market situations where they are not actually um, filtering or uh, or oversighting what the pl platform is being is filtering out. Um, to have competition may be good. To have a procedure to say, well, you can use one of these systems that are on the market. You know that would be sufficient uh, in order to uh, run your filtering decision on that might work, but not a personalized one. And the reason I don't think about, I think that the whole idea is to try and um, create or or fix a bias, a distortion that happened to our public sphere due to these filtering systems. So I don't think it would be useful to have a, a person, I mean, you, everyone could have their personalized uh, um, app, uh, but that should be, you know, the, the, this is sort of your personal butler, right? Or like uh, algorithmic uh, consumer app that would, uh, cater to your preferences. That is, of course, you know, that could be a market for this, but this is not a fix for, you know, our common goal in the, in the public sphere. Thank you. Very Thank much. you.